Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're going to discuss modular arithmetic. You probably already have used modular arithmetic intuitively when you've thought about the time of day or the day of the week. In this video, we're gonna put some names on these intuitive ideas that we use already. So here's some of the intuitive examples that I was talking about. Suppose that right now it is 1230, according to my computer, and we can ignore the AM or PM. And then you could ask, what time will it be in two hours? So something like this, we can do pretty easily, just starting at 1230 and then counting two more hours from there. And that gets us 2.30. Again, we're ignoring AMs and PMs. A slightly more difficult question would be, what time will it be in 42 hours? To do this, if we tried counting, it would be a little too slow. Instead, we could take 12.5 plus 42, where the 12.5 represents 1230 and that 42 represents 42 hours. And then we just take the remainder when you divide that sum by 12. So the sum of those two numbers, 12.5 and 42 is 54.5. And then we can take a remainder when we divide that by 12 and that will give us 6.5. And in a time notation, we can write that as 630. So that's one example where we're using modular arithmetic intuitively without even calling it that. Here's another example. Instead of the time of day, this one is about the day of the week. So today, it is Saturday. And a natural question I could ask is what day will it be in three days? So we can count from there. We can say one day later is Sunday, and then another day is Monday, and then Tuesday. So the answer is Tuesday. If I used a much larger number than three, it would be more annoying to try it that way. It would take too long to count. So we could try using modular arithmetic here. And without calling it that, we're just using the intuitive idea of remainders. And so the days of the week, we can map them to integers between zero and six inclusive. So Sunday, we can have that be zero. Monday, one, Tuesday, two, Wednesday, three, Thursday, four, Friday, five, and Saturday maps to six. And we're starting at Saturday. So we're starting with the six because Saturday corresponds to six. And we want to know what day will it be in 60 days. So we're adding 60 to that six. And then we take the remainder when we divide by seven because there are seven total days and each of these numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six, each of those are the possible remainders when we divide by seven. So we just added six plus 60 and we took the remainder when we divide by seven. So that's 66 divided by seven and the remainder is three. And once we get that three, we can look to see the map that we define in this bullet. What does the three correspond to? And the three is right here. It is Wednesday. So in order to define modulos and properties of modular arithmetic, 
we're going to first define divisibility and what it means to be a divisor. So we'll suppose that A and B are integers with B not equal to zero. And we'll also suppose that there exists an integer N such that A equals N times B. If we have this property that A equals N times B for some integer N, then we say that B divides A. And if we have this property that B divides A, we call B a divisor of A, or we can call it a factor of A. And there's a notation to say that B divides A, we write B vertical bar A. And note here that the order B and then A is the same as the order when we say B divides A. So they are written in the same left to right order. And if B does not divide A, we can use that same notation with a cross through it. And that just says B does not divide A right here. So we can see some easy properties of the divisibility that we defined on the last slide. So if C divides A and C divides B, then we can see pretty easily that C divides A plus B. How to see this? Well, if C divides A, then we can say that A equals M times C for some integer M. And if C divides B, similarly, we can say that B equals N times C for some possibly different integer N. And that means that A plus B equals MC plus NC, which equals by the distributive property, the quantity M plus N times C. And if A plus B equals this integer M plus N times C, by definition, that means that C divides A plus B. So that's how we get the top bullet. And another property which follows from a similar argument is that if C divides A, then C divides A times B for all integers B. And we can see how that's true because if C divides A, then A equals M times C for some integer M. And that means that A times B is gonna equal M times C times B, which equals M times B times C. And this is true for all integers B. And the quantity M times B times C is an integer times C. So it means that C divides A times B. And that's what we were claiming in that bullet right here. Let's look at one last property. If C divides B and B divides A, then C divides A. And we'll argue this similarly to the last two. If C divides B, then B equals M times C for some integer M. And if B divides A, then A equals N times B for some integer N. And we can substitute here. We have A equals N times B, which equals N times the quantity MC right here. We're substituting that for the B down here. And so, a equals n times m times c. So a is an integer times c. And that tells us that c divides a. So those are three properties of divisibility. And we can get another property using these. If we have c divides a and c divides b, then I claim c divides m a plus n b for all integers m and n. And we can see this easily because if c divides a, then that tells us that C divides M A for all integers M. And if C divides B, then that tells us that C divides N B for all integers N. And since C divides M A and C divides N B, then we can use this top bullet up here 
to say that C divides the sum of those two, which is MA plus NB. So we use this bullet to go from here to here. And we use this bullet right here to go from here to these two. So those are just a few properties. And now we can move on. So if we have an integer A and a positive integer D, then there are unique integers Q and R such that R is between zero and D, but not equal to D and A equals D times Q plus R. And you've probably seen these integers before back in elementary school. The Q is called the quotient. The R is called the remainder. So the three integers we have here are D. D is our divisor. Q is A divided by D without the remainder. And R, our remainder, we can write that as A mod D. And mod here, this is the mod that we are gonna do arithmetic on. And this fact right here, that there are unique integers with this property, that's actually something that's a theorem. So there is a proof of that fact. And you can look in the textbook or on the internet to see the proof if you like, but we are not gonna prove this in this video. This fact though, it is something that we take for granted whenever we do stuff like long division. So now that we defined mod, that remainder function that we saw on the last slide. So again, remainder R is just A mod D. So that's what we're defining A mod D to be is the remainder. We can quickly go through some examples of what this mod is. So 64 mod seven, this is just the remainder when you divide 64 by seven. And that's going to be one. And the reason for that is because we can write 64 equals nine times seven plus one. And on the last slide, the claim in the bullet said that there is a unique way to represent 64 as the divisor seven times some integer Q plus R where R is between zero and seven, but not equal to seven. And so if we find any way to express 64 in that way, it must be the unique way because there's only one way to express it that way. So again, on the last slide, we're using this fact right here, uniqueness. There's only one way to write A equals DQ plus R. And in this case, our A is 64, the D is seven, the Q is nine and the R is one. So 64 mod seven is one here. 80 mod six, similarly, all we have to do is find some way to express it as DQ plus R, where D here is six. So six Q plus R for some integer Q and some R, which is between zero and six, but not equal to six. And we can take R equals two because we can write 80 equals 13 times six plus two. Here's another example, 100 mod eight. We want to write 100 as eight times Q plus R for some R that's between zero and eight, but not equal to eight. And the R is gonna be four here because we can write 100 equals 12 times eight plus four. And finally, let's do a negative integer, minus 80 mod six. This one we can write as minus 80 equals minus 14 times six plus four. And that's the unique way to write it as six Q plus R where Q is an integer and R is some integer between zero and six, but not equal to six.
we can also talk about modular congruence. So we've seen mod as a function on the last slide, but we can also consider this relation. So we have two positive integers, x and y, and this word positive should not be here. So ignore that word positive, x and y can be any integers. And we say that x is congruent to y mod m. And we denote that by x triple horizontal bar y mod m. And in order to say that x is congruent to y mod m, all we need, the only property we need is that m divides x minus y. And we call M a modulus. And if X and Y are not congruent mod M, then we can write X not congruent to Y mod M. And we put the slash through that triple horizontal bar. And there's some simple properties we can see. Before we look at those properties though, let's consider an example up here. So a simple one, we can say two congruent to seven mod five. And that's because five divides seven minus two, and five also divides two minus seven. We can also say three congruent to 11 mod four. And that's because four divides 11 minus three, which is eight. Four also divides three minus 11, the additive inverse of eight. So those are some examples. And here are some simple properties that you can prove similarly to the ones we saw on the earlier slide. X congruent to Y mod M, if and only if X mod M equals y mod m. And another simple property that is left to the viewer is this biconditional. x congruent to y mod m if and only if there exists an integer z such that x equals y plus m times z. So here's a few examples. We can ask, is 2020 congruent to zero mod 10? So in order to determine whether that's true, we can see by the definition, does 10 divide the difference of those two? And yes, it does. 10 divides 2020 minus zero, which is 2020. Because 10 equals 202, or because 2020 equals 202 times 10. So 10 divides 2020. We can also ask, is 2021 congruent to two mod five? And to test that, we can see does five divide 2021 minus two, and it does not. We can also ask, is negative 80 congruent to 32 mod seven? To test this, we can see does seven divide the difference of those two? Does seven divide 32 minus negative 80? And seven does divide it because the difference is 112 and that is 16 times seven. We can also ask, is minus 80 congruent to 40 mod six? And this is, the answer is yes here. Minus 80 mod six equals four. 40 mod six also equals four, so they are equal mod six. Another way to see that is that 40 minus negative 80 equals 120, and that's divisible by six. So either way, we got yes. So here's some properties. Suppose that X is congruent to Y mod M and Z is congruent to W mod M. And I claim that X plus Z is congruent to Y plus W mod M and X times Z is congruent to Y times W mod M. The first one, we can see that pretty fast. So we know since up here, we're supposing in that first bullet, X congruent to Y mod M, that tells us that 
m divides x minus y. So we got that from there. We also have m divides z minus w. And that's coming from the fact that z is congruent to w mod m. So if m divides x minus y and m divides z minus w, by the property that we proved on the earlier slide, m must also divide the sum of those two. So m divides x minus y plus z minus w. And that's equal to x plus z minus the quantity y plus w by rearrangement. And since we now have the m divides the quantity x plus z minus the quantity y plus w by definition of modular equivalence, that means that x plus z is congruent to y plus w mod m, the thing that we're trying to prove right here. So that's how we got that. And the product one is a little more interesting. So for the product one, we can use the fact that if we have x congruent to y mod m, then we can say that x equals y plus tm for some integer t. And similarly, since we have z congruent to w mod m, we can say that z equals w plus sm for some integer s. And we're going to use these two ways of writing x and z to prove this product property right here. How will we do that? Well, we'll just write x times z and we'll substitute. So we'll multiply y plus tm times w plus sm. So we get y times w, we get y times sm, which gives us right here, the SYM. We get W times TM, which gives us the TWM. So we covered these three terms so far. And then the last term is from the TM here and the SM right there. We get TSM squared right here. So we just showed that XZ equals YW plus TWM plus SYM plus TSM squared. And if we subtract yw from both sides, we can say xz minus yw equals twm plus sym plus tsm squared, which equals, we can use the distributive property here and say tw plus sy plus tsm times m. So we have xz minus yw equals some integer here times m, which means that m divides xz minus yw, which means by definition of the modular equivalence we have right here, xz congruent to yw mod m. And I'm going to mention a couple other properties. These are ways that you can calculate a modular arithmetic problem much more simply than using the definitions. So the first shortcut, if you want to calculate x plus y mod m, then you should calculate x mod m plus y mod m, and then do that mod m. Another analogous shortcut for multiplication right here, x times y mod m. In order to calculate that one, do x mod m and then do y mod m, multiply them together and then take that mod m. And let's look at some examples. So here's one. What is the product 2020 times 2021 mod 10? So we'll just take each of the terms in the product and we will take the mod 10 and then we'll multiply what we get. So we'll do 2020 mod 10 times 2021 mod 10 and then take that mod 10. The 2020 mod 10, we saw that earlier, that was zero. And 2021 mod 10, this one, since 2020 was zero, 2021 is gonna be one. So we get zero times one mod 10. And this is just zero mod 10, so it's zero. 
here's another one, a similar one. What is 2021 times 2022 mod 10? And we'll do the same method on this one, but different answer this time. So we can write this as 2021 mod 10 times 2022 mod 10 and take that mod 10. And 2021 mod 10, this is one as we saw. 2022 mod 10, this one is two. So we get one times two mod 10 and that gives us two. Here's another one. What about 2020 times 2021 mod nine? And this is gonna be the same as 2020 mod nine times 2021 mod nine. And 2020 mod nine, we can see that this is four. Why is that? Well, I claim 2016, that one is divisible by nine. So there is a nice property of multiples of nine and base 10. So when you write multiples of nine and base 10, the property is that their integers, or sorry, their digits, their digits sum to a multiple of nine. So any multiple of nine, if you look at its digits, the digits also are gonna to sum to a multiple of nine. And so any integer, you can just check its digits if you wanna check whether it's a multiple of nine. So we look at this one here, 2016, and we can add those digits together, two plus zero plus one plus six, and we get a total of nine. And nine, this is a multiple of nine. So. 2016, since the sum of its digits mod 10, or sorry, sum of its digits in base 10 is a multiple of nine, that means that 2016 itself is a multiple of nine. And I mean, you can also just check this using a calculator that nine divides 2016, but you can use that trick with the sum of the digits for any number to see if it's a multiple of nine. So it's something useful to know. So nine divides 2016, so that means that 2020 mod nine is gonna be four because 2020 is four plus 2016. And 2021 mod nine is five because 2021 is five plus 2016. And that means that 2020 times 2021 mod nine is just four times five mod nine. And that gives us two. So let's now do a word problem involving time and we'll have some multiplication in there too. So let's say it's currently two o'clock. Again, I'm ignoring all the AMs and all the PMs. Okay, I watch some movie five times in a row and then I never watch it again after that. We'll suppose that the movie is exactly 37 hours long and I take no breaks between the viewings and I don't take any time to turn the, the movie back to the beginning between the viewing. So as soon as the movie ends, it starts over again. So I have some tape that's already, it's ready to play it five times in a row. I don't have to do anything manually. So it's exactly five times 37 hours later when I finish watching the movie. So the question is, what time will I finish watching this movie for the last time? And note that I said, I'll never watch it again after I finish watching it these five times in a row. So the last time, that's, that's the end of these five times in a row. So I wanna find the time that is five times 37 hours away from two o'clock. How can I do that? Well, I can just do some simple modular arithmetic here. I can start with two and I can add five times 37. And then I can take that mod 12. And we can use that property we saw that if we wanna do X times Y mod M, 
we can calculate that by doing x mod m times y mod m and then take that product mod m. And we want to do 2 plus 5 times 37 mod 12. So we can do 2 mod 12 plus 5 times 37 mod 12. That gives us 2. And the 5 times 37 mod 12, we can do 5 mod 12 times 37 mod 12. 37 mod 12 is 1. So this 37 gave us that 1 right there. So we get 2 plus 5 times 1 mod 12. And this gives us 7. So the time when I finish watching this movie for the last time will be 7 o'clock. Again, we're ignoring the AMs and the PMs here. And here are a couple more problems. You might find these a little more interesting than the last ones we saw, because these have some exponents. What is 2 to the 2020 mod 5? So when you see a problem like this, I encourage you to look for patterns by investigating small cases. And this is advice that I've given before, too. So we'll try the small exponents first, since we're talking about an exponent problem here. Those are our small cases. So 2 to the 1, that's a good one to try. When we do that mod 5, we get 2. 2 to the 2 mod 5, that's 4, because 2 squared is 4. 2 to the 3 mod 5, this is slightly more interesting, because we get 8 mod 5, and then we actually have to do a remainder, and we get 3. And then 2 to the 4 is the most interesting of all. 2 to the 4 mod 5, we get 16 mod 5. And this one, as the remainder, we get 1. And that makes this problem a lot easier all of a sudden. Because 2 to the 2020, this equals 2 to the 4 to the 505. And so to calculate 2 to the 2020 mod 5, we can write this as 2 to the 4 to the 505 mod 5. And we can think of this 2 to the 4 to the 505 as we're writing 2 to the 4 times 2 to the 4 times 2 to the 4. Keep on going. Times 2 to the 4 a total of 505 times. And we're just gonna use our property that we know x times y mod m equals x mod m y mod m mod m. And we can add more variables to this. We want to add a Z in front. Then we can say Z times X times Y mod M equals Z mod M times X mod M times Y mod M mod M. You can keep on adding as many variables as you want there in front. And in fact, you can make it so there's a total of 505 variables there. And so that applies specifically to this problem here. If we want this quantity right here, mod five, this is equal to two to the four mod five times two to the four mod five times two to the four mod five, a total of 505 times, and then mod five on that final product. And we just saw two to the four mod five is one every time. So we get one times one times a ton of ones multiplied together mod phi, the number of ones we have there is 505. And so we end up with just a one. So that is our first example with exponents and mods. Let's see another one. What is three to the 2020 mod 26? Like the last one, we'll try some small cases first. Three to the one mod 26, this is just three. Three to the two mod 26 is three squared, which is nine. This one is interesting though. Three to the three mod 26, we get 27 mod 26 and it becomes one. This makes the problem much easier because three to the 2020 
we can write that as three to the 2019 times three. 2019, this is another interesting one. 2019 is divisible by three. Three divides 2019. I'll mention any integer written in base 10 that is divisible by three, the sum of its digits will be divisible by three. So it's similar to the multiples of nine. So any integer in base 10 that was divisible by nine, the sum of its digits is divisible by nine. And with three, same thing, replace those nines with threes. Any integer in base 10 that is divisible by three will have some of, some of its digits in base 10 divisible by three. So we can see 2019 here, the sum of the digits in base 10 is two plus zero plus one plus nine. That equals 12 and three divides 12. So that's an easy way to check that three divides 2019. And you can check this for much larger numbers. Like you can see that three divides 111, 111, 111, 111, 111. A very large number. We wouldn't have to, we wouldn't want to have to divide that. But we can see that the sum of the digits is one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one. And we have a total of one, two, three, four, five times three ones there. So 15 ones in that in that number. So the sum of the digits in base 10 is 15 which is divisible by three. So these are just some interesting facts about divisibility here. Not, not too important, but they're good shortcuts, these facts about the three and the nine, if you do have a problem involving threes or nines. So we have three to the 2020 equals three to the 2019 times three and 2019, we said it's divisible by three, so we can divide it by three and we get 673. So we can write three to the 2019 as three to the three raised to the 673. And again, we have the times three here. We still have it right here. And now we can use that same property that we used on the last slide, that X times Y mod M is the same as X mod M times Y mod M mod M. So three to the 2020 mod 26 equals three to the three to the 673 times three mod 26. We saw that three to the three mod 26 is one. So we can replace the three to the three here with a one right here. So we get one to the 673 times three mod 26. And that gives us three and that's it. The answer is three. And that brings us to the end of this video, but we'll see more about elementary number theory in the next video. Thanks for watching.